today we're going to be talking recording in progress excellent okay so as lena said today i'm going to be talking with you all about forest management and so what i do here at the university of maine is i help train students so that when they're able to leave my classroom my courses this program they're ready to go out into the workforce and be foresters and a large large part of that i would say all of that um, in some facet or another is thinking about forest management got it so i have a definition of what i think forest management is but i would be curious before i tell you what i think of when i hear forest management if any of you would be willing to share what you think of when you hear forest management or what kind of comes to mind when we when we say that phrase. And anything is fine. As I tell my students, there is no wrong answer here. Whatever you think works for me. I think of being able to create like a healthy, sustainable forest. Mm, yes, that's such, that's an excellent one. Um, I hear that from folks, like when I talk with small woodlot owners, that's maybe the biggest um, term that gets tossed out is I just, I want a healthy forest. I want a sustainable forest. So yes, absolutely. Are there other ideas that come to mind when people think about forest management? I think of like supporting an ecosystem with like goals in mind, like different um, yes. hopes for the property. Yes. I also agree with that. So having a goal, trying to achieve it, definitely. Other pieces for folks? I won't drag this out too long, I promise. But if anyone has other things I wanted to share. Okay, so. Oh, maybe a bus route, I guess. Uh, all right, so there, you know, in forestry, we have a lot of terms. We actually even have our own dictionary. So if any of you are ever interested in really going down the rabbit hole, we have a whole dictionary of forestry. So this definition that I'm sharing with you all right now, it's there's a lot packed in here, but I think it really just highlights that when we consider forest management, at least from a forestry professional standpoint, there's a lot of pieces that go into this. It's not just about cutting trees. It's not just about um, making two by fours that show up at Home Depot. It's really this integration of biological and physical sciences. More and more, we're thinking about economics, um, social and policy components to all of this. And we take this huge dearth of information and we try and synthesize it in such a way that we're able to promote healthy forests into the future, that we're able to have the species that we want, that we're able to have the different age classes that we want, that we're able to create the different habitats that we want. And so all of the pieces or all of the photos that I'm going to show you today are from managed forests. And I also want to just circle back really quickly and acknowledge what Lino was sharing us with us in the very beginning of this. And that's that our perspective on forest management is largely from, you know, the arrival of European settlers onward. But that's missing a big chunk. We, we know that these forests have been managed in New England, across North America, across the globe for so much further back than we tend to look. So one of the pieces of forest management that you might hear someone say sometimes is something like, how do we get back to our original forest? Or how do we get back to our baseline? It's a really tricky piece to actually achieve because I don't know that we necessarily know what our quote unquote original forest look like because people have been using these forests in some capacity or another for a really, really long time. And so when I think about what forest management is, to me, it's what we call the art and science of altering the forest to meet human needs in a sustainable way. And we throw art and science out there because it kind of protects us and gives us the flexibility to take really good science and make a decision, but also acknowledging that no forest is the same, that no set of objectives are the same, and that in addition to the science, we also need personal experience, personal background um, to make the most informed decision and really, when we talk about forest management, no matter what we're saying our forest should be managed for, it's through the lens of human needs. Our forests grow, well, my husband and I were just having this conversation this morning. He's a forester as well. And so we were talking about how sometimes trees trees will grow whether we're here or not. So that's another caveat of all this is that we're putting on this lens of what humans need. And if we're practicing sustainable or responsible forest management, 
we should be promoting a forest that maintains its health well into the future. So that's what I think of when I say forest management. And that's, you know, that's a nice definition. I'm, I'm content with that. But I think the nuts and bolts of it is what's really important. So it's great to say I want a healthy and a sustainable forest. But how do we actually do that? That's the part where the science comes in where all those different facets of biology and physiology and social uh, science come together so that we can achieve our goal. So I'll circle back to all of you. When I say I want to, well, to someone's earlier definition of forest management, if I say I want to maintain a healthy forest, how do I actually do that? What does that actually mean? We have this phrase in forestry we call boots on the ground. So boots on the ground, what would that actually look like if I say I want a healthy forest? What do you think? Species diversity. Mm, species diversity. Yes, absolutely. That's a big part of it. Having lots of different species. Other pieces? Age diversity. Age diversity. Yep. And so we acknowledge that having, well, so there's a time and place for all kinds of forest conditions, but we generally speaking as forestry professionals acknowledge that more diversity is better. Less diversity, maybe in a particular location, like a single acre, there could be some justification for that or a, a single five acre block, but across especially our forested landscape, we want more diversity in tree species. We want diversity in age classes. We want diversity in forest cover types and wildlife habitat. More diversity is better. And for me, that really all begins with good data. So good forest management should be grounded in good forestry data. What does that mean? Well, that can be a lot of different things, but it should, and it should can be a loaded word, right? But for me, it should start with a good forest inventory so that we understand what we have before we make a management decision. And what gets included in that forest inventory can be a whole bunch of different things. And that's really where if you're trying to get your students out into the classroom, this is where you could have some flexibility about what kind of information you wanna collect. So this is a study that I was involved in this summer and I've never done this before and I hope to never have to do it again. But um, what you're looking at here is little tiny seedlings that have all been tagged with, they, we used to call them pipe cleaners, but now they're called fuzzy sticks. So we spent so many hours this summer on our hands and knees twisting these little tiny colorful pipe cleaners around little tiny seedlings in an effort to collect some data so we could make an informed decision about how to manage our forests as we're seeing more persistent summer droughts. So this is on one end of the extreme in terms of data collection, but it just goes to show you can get as into the weeds on this as you want or more hands off, but good management for me begins with good data. And then there are a few other pieces that as I'm thinking about what should our forest be managed for, that I want to factor in. And the first one really is what does the landowner want? Or what does the land manager or the managing agency, what do they want? Because so much of forestry is guided by, again, those human objectives. So we need to know what those objectives are first and foremost. So that can look different or similar, again, depending on who you are and, and what you're trying to achieve. And so here are two, I want to say they're the extreme ends of forest management because they don't necessarily have to be, but just to show you what some different organizations might be looking for. So this right here, uh, this is a meeting with IFNW over in New Hampshire, thinking about how we manage our forests for wildlife objectives. And then on the other side of the screen, this is the meeting with um, seven islands up outside of uh, Ashland, Maine. So up in the Northern part of the state, thinking about how we manage our forests for more production oriented goals. And there can be some overlap between what those landowners are both trying to achieve. And there can also be some separate components to that. So the very first thing if you're thinking about how do I manage this forest is what does the landowner want? Even if you're the landowner, it's important to say, what is it that I want my forest to look like? What am I trying to achieve? And then you have to put the little caveat on there is what I'm asking of the forest actually achievable? And we can talk about that in just a minute, but it all begins with what is the landowner looking for? So if we think about this, you could also say, what is it that we're trying to get from the forest? And let's circle back to those two objectives that I just shared with you to see if we can figure out what or how those objectives might differ. So if we're that first agency, so New Hampshire, IF, and W, and our primary goal is to maintain wildlife habitat, acknowledging that anytime we go in and 
work in a forest or manipulate a forest, it's probably going to cost us some money. So we don't necessarily need to make a profit on our forest management. We can't go in the hole either. So we need to stay financially neutral, or if we can, add a little bit more to the pot. And then also the aesthetics of the forest are important. So as a wildlife agency, that's maybe they're having public that's out recreating on their land regularly. They care about wildlife habitat, staying financially neutral, and also just keeping an aesthetically pleasing forest. So that's one set of objectives. If we contrast that with maybe one of our more production oriented uh, companies, for example, they're trying to make a profit. And there's nothing wrong with trying to make a profit off of our forest, especially if it's done in a sustainable way, but that might guide the direction of the forest differently than if we're say managing for wildlife habitat, or maybe not, you're gonna tell me, I guess. So if our objective now is to think about having financial returns, but also if I'm a responsible forester trying to manage this forest for the long term, I, I also really want that forest to be healthy and I want it to stay forest. I don't want to manage the forest in such a way that growth is depleting and species health is depleting so that in 50 years, what I've got left is something I can't do anything with. So these are two examples of what forestry objectives could look like and how we go about managing the forest to meet objective one or objective two can be similar or can be different. So can you all think if we were trying to manage for objective one versus objective two, if you were the forester out in the woods, would you do anything different? Would you do the exact same thing for both? How do you all feel about that? What do you think about that? So I'll give you, oh. I would think that if you're trying to make money with objective two, and that was more of like a primary, you might do more significant harvesting or logging. Maybe, yeah, absolutely. Maybe it's going to come in the form of you enter the forest more frequently, or when you enter the forest, you take more trees. Absolutely. Other thoughts? And also for objective two, you would not um, be as concerned about where you're harvesting those trees as you may be with objective one. Um, in in one, you'd be looking more at the habitat for the wildlife and not wanting to be as to be the least disruptive as you could yeah. be in your harvest practice. That's definitely possible. Absolutely. Other thoughts from folks? So this is where this is where I really find forestry to be maybe the most interesting. It's like one big puzzle, right? So you're trying to take all of this information that you know about the forest, that you know about what the landowner wants, and it's almost like you're putting it in your brain and it's some sort of computer. And at the end, you want to spit out a solution to this problem for them. And so there are, again, lots of ways that these objectives can run parallel to each other or ways that they could run sort of counter to each other. So one might be, you know, if I really am, if finances are driving what I'm doing first and foremost, then yeah, maybe I do need to take out more trees than if I'm looking to create wildlife habitat. Or another place that we notice there being kind of a conflict, especially between these two objectives, a lot of the tree species that animals want to eat are the same ones that we're trying to grow. So that can get a little bit problematic, right? Like if I say, I want a lot of deer on my property, but I also want to grow a lot of sugar maple. Well, all of a sudden I might find myself in a severe conflict because every time I grow a sugar maple, a deer comes and munches it. And then I have to say, well, what do I want? Deer or sugar maple? So this is where we're doing this back and forth all the time. But I would argue that especially if both parties are again thinking about sustainable and responsible and healthy forests that no matter which objective you choose you're trying to promote the tree species in your forest that want to be there you're not fighting against it that you're looking um, to make sure there are no diseases or insect outbreaks that you're thinking about how to make your forest more resilient to things like climate change so again, there can be overlap depending on your objective or there can be contrast, but good responsible forest management starts with healthy trees that stay trees well into the future. So there are some other pieces that I think about again when I'm considering what to do and how to manage a forest. And I broke it down into these two categories. So the first is what are the possibilities from my stand? So now I know what I wanna achieve and now I have to frame that within the realistic possibilities. And then also I have to acknowledge that there are gonna be some constraints. So I'm always telling my students, you know, come up with the very best solution and then frame that in the reality that you're working. And sometimes those two 
you know, very best solution in reality may not line up, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't think about what you really want and then wrap it up in the context of what's actually going on in the world around you. So how do we do this? This is my personal checklist. And depending on who you talk to, there may be other pieces that get added on here. But again, if I'm walking into a forest for the first time or the seventh time, and I'm trying to figure out what do I want to do here? This is what I'm going to be considering. So first and foremost, what species are present? And you can break that down into as big or small categories as you want. So you might ask yourself, do I have a lot of softwood or evergreen trees? Do I have a lot of deciduous or hardwood trees? Maybe it's that simple for you. And so, you know, you could be thinking like, I've got a lot of evergreens, I've got a lot of hardwoods, or I've got some kind of combination of the two. You could go even further into that. Like I notice I've got a lot of red spruce and balsam fir and paper birch. The detail here depends on, again, what objectives you're trying to achieve. But species doesn't just have to mean trees. So it could be uh, what species of herbaceous vegetation do I see? Uh, what wildlife indicators do I see? Do I notice that I have a lot of snowshoe hair? Do I see that I've got a lot of songbirds? So species can be broad in that sense as well. And then you also wanna think about how big is this forest? If you're trying to manage 100,000 acres, you're gonna take a different approach, I would imagine. And if you're trying to manage five acres, maybe there's a level of intensity that you can commit to a smaller forest versus a bigger. So am I thinking about, you know, managing this one parcel of forest here? Or am I thinking about managing this entire landscape? So the scale is going to be important as well. Up next, I would be thinking about what are the signs of disturbance that are out in the forest? And for us, often, that might be things like a tree that's tipped over. Wind is our primary disturbance in these northeastern forests. So you might see a tree that's tipped over like this and that's come after a big windstorm or you're out there 50 years later and you can see this sort of topography on the landscape that's telling you in this forest where I'm working, there's a likelihood of a wind event. And that's something you might keep in mind, you know, as you're considering what trees to take out. The other most common disturbance for us in New England is humans. And so if you saw signs of cut stumps, that would also give you kind of a clue of what's happened in the past. And so we can't move forward with our forest until we understand what's got us to where we are in present day. The next piece that I would be considering is what do my trees look like on site? So I know what I've got for species. I know what I've got for disturbance. And then I want to start categorizing the trees themselves. So do I have, you know, mostly big trees? Do I have mostly little regeneration, like, you know, seedlings and saplings that are coming up? Do I have some combination of the two? Because again, you can start to think about this as kind of like a not... We always say there's no cookbook in forestry, but I'm going to tell you, you could try for a cookbook in forestry. So you're going to be doing almost like this dichotomous key of, I've got this, so I'm going to move in this direction, or I don't have this, so I'm going to move in this direction. It's all about information gathering. And then the next piece that I would think about is, okay, is my forest really dark? Is my forest really open? And what I mean by that is how much sunlight is getting through, because that's a key component to how trees are growing. So if I'm walking through a forested stand and I'm not seeing much sunlight coming through when it's dark, that's going to tell me you know, that maybe I wouldn't expect to find any little seedlings on the ground because there's not enough sunlight getting there. And so if what I care about is having more seedlings on the forest floor, then I'm going to have to go in and take out some trees and open it up and get more light. Or if I'm in a situation like this, this was a forest that was cut specifically for songbird habitat. And in this particular instance, they wanted it to be a bigger opening to attract bird species that really like that sort of shrubby forest condition. So here I'd see a lot more light and I might say to myself, yeah, you know what? This forest is young, it was cut not that long ago. I'm just gonna let it go for a while because it's doing what it needs to do and I can just step back for the time being. So this would be my checklist as I'm thinking about what I might wanna do with my forest. It's again, just this information gathering stage because it all starts right with good data at the very beginning. So as we think about how that translates into our possibilities, there's, some pieces that we would be looking at specifically. So again, what species do we have? We use this term composition. It's just a percentage. It's a way to, to talk to ourselves or talk to our peers about how much of um, a given species we have in a forest. So I'd say, you know, I've got a high composition of red spruce. That means I've got a high percentage of red spruce or whatever it is. We also care about age of the forest because younger trees grow differently than middle-aged, than really old trees. So we think about that piece of information. We think about what we have for those small seedlings and saplings. So what's there? How do we anticipate them growing into the future? In New England, we use 
trees that have established on their own to get the next generation of the forest started. So that's really important when we think about forest management. What do we see in terms of healthy forests? Do the crowns look good? Are they green? Are they, you know, looking really vigorous? Like they're able to keep supporting the tree. That's the food factory. So if the crowns look sort of yellowed and shrunk, that might tell me something. Or um, do I notice that there's a lot of um, like the sap sucker holes, for example, that you might see going up the stem of a tree? That might tell me, well, that would definitely tell me that tree is starting to decay and it's maybe having some health problems. And I'm also going to be thinking about how are the trees in relation to each other? Are they really clumped and dense? Are there some sort of openings in the forest? Again, maybe from a windstorm or a past harvest event. What do I see? And we call that the forest structure. So that's also gonna inform what our options are in terms of forest management. And then just as importantly, so I've taken all that information, I've synthesized, I've come up with the perfect forest management plan. And then all of a sudden I say, hey, wait a second, I need to at least not go in the hole on this forest management and the local mill is not taking the species that I'm gonna be cutting. What does that mean for me? So we might think about local markets or maybe I'd say to myself, you know what? They are taking Aspen like crazy at the mill right now. And all of a sudden I'm now gonna have more money coming in. So I can think about something a little more creative to do with my forest management than I might not have. Um, the other piece we need to think about is who's gonna do this work for us. So we know that our forest, uh, the folks who get out and run the equipment in the woods, tends to be an aging population that's not being replaced as rapidly as we would like to see. So you also need to think about, do I have someone that I could call to help me make this happen? Do I have an operator that can get out in the woods and do this with me? And then policies. We have lots of great rules and regulations in the state of Maine, but we need to be aware of those. You can't just, um, you know, for example, cut right up to uh, a water body without consideration of that. And then public perception. We have this term that we call social capital. And what I think of when I hear that is we can only do what the public will allow us. Now I'm a private landowner, I guess I could say, I'm gonna do whatever I want, but that maybe wouldn't serve me all that well. So we wanna think about how this work is gonna be perceived by other people. Does that all make sense to everyone or are there more pieces of this that you can think of? Okay, very good, we'll keep cruising them. Um, so, Just to, to wrap up, I just wanted to show you a couple of examples about what forest management can actually look like in the woods, because it's all well and good to hear about this, but it's maybe helpful also to see some real case studies. So this is, again, this is that IFNW property that we saw way in the beginning. And what their objectives are is a reminder, make a little bit of money so that they can keep doing what they're doing. But really what they're concerned about is promoting habitat for deer and moose and songbirds. And so what they have done here, this may be in contrast to some other folks that are really thinking about um, straight up economic returns. They're saying, let's create some places on our forest where we just cut trees, promote a bunch of new trees to come in that the deer and the moose like to eat and just basically say, here you go, animals have a smorgasbord. And so that might not be what a forester trying to promote regeneration of the next cohort is going to say, or the next forest is going to say, but they're acknowledging that part of their objective is to make food for wildlife, and that means cutting trees to grow more trees. So that's one way that they've achieved their objective. And then another example, and I find this one uh, alarming and also fascinating. So this is fortunately not for us in Maine. This is down in West Virginia, but this is forest management that's being used after uh, the closing of coal mines. So what we're looking at here is the coal mine after it's closed down. And then they go in and they pile up a bunch of material. And then what they are trying to do next is to turn it into this forested condition. And I just find this, again, remarkable that they're able to, in a short window of time, take what looks like a terrible eyesore on the landscape and through forest management, they're able to push it back to this forested community. Now we could have a conversation about the broader environmental implications of all this, but I think it just goes to show that when we, harness the power of forests, we can do some really remarkable things, or at least that's what I'm thinking of when I see this. And so to wrap it all up, I know that some of you may be thinking about how can you do some forest management activities in the classroom, or how could you maybe integrate some of this information into the work you're already doing. And if I was, or in the past when I have worked, um, especially with folks that are maybe new to forestry, I start with just good old fashioned field observations. This is a great way 
for people to start paying attention to what's out there because again, what's out there is what informs what we can do. So just field observations about what do you see, referring back to that checklist or other items that you wanna add. How did we get to where we are and what are our options going forward? And for me, just to have that kind of literacy, especially for students that are in a state like Maine where forestry is such a component of what we do at the state scale, I think that would be awesome. And there are some really nice resources available too. So if you haven't seen any of these before, some of them are free, some you have to purchase, but they're all good. Um, the Natural Landscapes of Maine is a really helpful tool when you're, again, trying to get a sense of what's out there and why. This Forest Forensics book is really awesome. It's like CSI, but out in the forest. So you go through and you do these checklists to figure out what caused the forest to get where you are today. And then the Forestries of Maine, another really good publication from the Maine Forest Service that can help you identify the tree species that are out there, start to think about what they need, what are their habitat requirements, how did they get there? And then I really like this one and I've started using it with my own students. This is Forestry for Maine Birds. This was developed with the Audubon and there's some really helpful checklists in there. So if you wanted to go out with your students and try and figure out, well, we've got a forest, what songbirds might we find here? You can go through and do these checklists looking at things like species and age and um, brush piles, and it can help you identify places where you might find different songbirds. So again, just some really good resources that are available for us in the state and across the region. And so that's what I have for you all today, but I'm happy to answer any questions or again, if there's something I can follow up with you about after this, please let me know. Awesome. We don't have any questions in the chat, but did anyone have anything for Nicole before we switch things over? I'll just say one of my favorite things about teaching with force is that it can provide a really awesome opportunity to look at the history of where we are and how we got there um, and can be a great way to kind of mix um, social studies with science because there's so much there. The land can tell us so much about what's happened and where we are now and how we got there. And you can also dive into why we got there and all of that stuff. It's a lot of opportunities there. All right, so we can toss things over to Anita um, if you're ready. There, hopefully you can hear me. Sure and, can. Um, Great. So I wanted to say hi to everybody. It's nice to see you. I'm actually um, currently living in Tennessee. So I'm looking at uh, rain clouds here today, but uh, just finished up a really awesome hike um, yesterday of about nine and a half miles through um, lots of uh, oak forests, which was really cool. So I'm going to So hopefully you can uh, let's see. So are you all set on the presentation section? Okay, awesome, great. Um, I'm a little rusty on this. <laughs> I'm busy with with moving and everything. So anyway, so um, my name is Anita Smith, and I um, am recently uh, moved to, to Tennessee, but before that, I taught for. Uh, 25 years up in Maine in a public school setting and have also done a lot of work with homeschoolers and with uh, the Maine Master Naturalist program. So that's a little bit of my background. I taught mostly third to sixth grade while I was in the schools. And then with homeschool, it's been anywhere from pre-K up through to the high school level. Uh, so I have my email and phone number and everything there. So even though I'm not in Maine right at the moment, uh, I, certainly you can feel free to contact me and, um, get, be, I'm more than willing to share, share ideas. Let's see. So anyways, this is a little bit of a background. I taught at China Middle and China Primary Schools. 
And out back behind the middle school, which is here, and the primary school, which is back here, we have about 50 or 60 acres of land that belongs to our town. And so we have ended up creating a bunch of trails and we currently have around 20 different outdoor classroom spaces um, out there. We also have uh, this wildlife trail that we created and I'll show you a little bit about that later. And um, we have a tree ID trail that has different signs identifying um, some of the trees along the way. And um, so, like I said, I worked at the schools and, um, you know, even though it's great that this is right by the school, this area is open to the public. So anybody can go. It's pretty much dawn to dusk or yeah, dawn to dusk. So um, whenever, you know, even if the schools are open, the public is able to park in the school parking lots and uh, people can walk around and in, enjoy the forest. Uh, let's see. Um, the North Loop and the South Loop on the map there are really quite a ways back from the schools. It takes about 10 minutes or so to walk back there with kids. So most of the activities and most of our outdoor classroom spaces are within about a five minute walk for the students. One of the things when we developed this, and I'll go into the history in a minute, um, was to make sure that it was really accessible for the teachers and the kids to get outside and, and get right into the woods and, and doing things. Uh, we are a certified tree farm. And part of the deal on that is that we have a, um, a forest management plan that is written by a local forester. And we try to update that every 10 years or so. Sometimes it's a little earlier, sometimes it's a little bit later, but, but there is a management plan. And, um, and that has pretty much been developed again by talking to some of the people in town, those of us that are really involved in the forest and um, just making sure that it's, it's current and being used. So um, back in the 1980s or so, uh, just individual teachers in the school would go out and use the forest for different projects. There were a couple of um, very you know, simple, basic trails, nothing really special. There were a few little openings with some, some log seats and uh, it, was, it was very simple, but the teachers were able to, to go outside. And then back in the mid 1990s, there was a big push in the state of Maine, um, kind of in response to some of the, the harvesting that was done after the spruce budworm up in northern Maine. Uh, there was a lot of controversy about, you know, management and are, you know, the lumber companies getting too stingy or, you know, how are they managing the land? So um, we had a local forester who, really wanted to create this forest space that would teach the public about about you know, good good forestry. So in 1994 we had a committee that was formed. It was school staff, community people, natural resource professionals. Um, we really just got this group together. We brainstormed a lot of ideas of what we wanted to do, what we wanted to see. We took into account what the teachers were doing for you know the lessons that they had in the classrooms. We didn't want to create something that would make more work for the teachers because um, many of us on the committee were already you know were teachers and we knew that teachers' plates were very full. So we formed this committee, came up with a mission and a vision about what we wanted to do with this land. Really, just. And to just, you know, get that out to not only school kids, but to adults. So then from 95 to 98, we ended up doing a harvest. The, um, the area really hadn't had a lot of active harvesting up until that time. Some of it was overgrown, 
you know, farmland that had been, you know, just kind of let go. So there wasn't a lot of really high quality timber there, but we started, we did the forest harvest. We created um, several different outdoor classroom spaces. The skid trails became our walking trails and we created some specific forestry demonstration areas. They're really, you know, quite small, uh, but it was to demonstrate some of these different types of um, forestry management techniques. So we had um, one's called the seed tree. We had a shelter wood. We did some selective cutting. We did a plantation area. Um, we had a very small clear cut uh, area. We also did a couple of areas where it was basically demonstrating, you know, not such good forest management to show what that looked like. So if students, you know, and, and the public saw that, they could kind of recognize it. And we ended up creating a learning guide for our staff. So whoops, uh, you can't really see it. There's a binder um, that has information for the school staff to use about each of those different classrooms. So in 97, we won the Maine Tree Farm Award. Um, but then good old Mother Nature, as Nicole mentioned, sometimes uh, nature throws things at you. We had the, our ice storm in 1998, and it had a very big impact on um, some of our spaces. So we had to go in and kind of redesign some of the areas. We had to clean up some of the other areas and, uh, you know, really hit, hit um, our forest pretty hard. So because of that, we hadn't done any active harvests until 2020. Um, so, but it was really, a, it was, it's been very interesting to see how the forest has grown and changed over, over those years. Um, any questions so far? All right, so I'll keep going. Um, so as far as the land goes, again, it was, it's China. And in order to get things going, um, we started out again, back in the 1990s, we got a bunch of different grants that were out there. Um, we had some donations of materials to create our outdoor classroom spaces um, and also some donations of money to, to do a couple of different programs. We did convince our select board to allow the harvest revenue to come back into um, the actual program. So that, that really helped to get some of that seed funding going. But for the most part, our town has not spent a lot of money on this area. We've really done a lot of things with grants and with, with donations, with volunteers. Um, so that keeps our select board happy that we haven't been asking them for all kinds of money for things along the way. So we have had a lot of volunteers to come and to maintain our trails and our outdoor classroom spaces. But one of the things that's really interesting, um, you know, it, it is a challenge to keep something like this going. And very often it's nice to have some sort of champion to kind of oversee the area to help coordinate people. Um, an advisory committee can be really helpful with um, setting up this type of a program. Um, and so we do have an advisory committee. Sometimes it's a lot of people, sometimes it's it's just a few. It really, you know, kind of waxes and wanes, but um, we just try to keep that going to get as much public input as possible. And since we won the Tree Farm Award back in 97, we've added nine new classrooms, outdoor classroom spaces, um, including this a wildlife trail and our tree ID trail. So, um, and like I said, I'll show some pictures of that in a little while. Uh, we currently do have some support from our town um, and from our from the select board. So in the last two years, we added, um, just last month, we put in a 14 by 32 foot outdoor classroom building. 
and we are in the process of getting it wired and adding in a heat source so that we can offer more programming for the students and for for the public you know both during the daytime and even in the into the evening program uh evening time so we're really excited about that um there's definitely a need to on for ongoing staff training and you know you really do need to have some administrative support um i'm not sure for those that are are there you know how many of you are in the public schools but administrative support is is very often key it also really helps to keep um to work as a team to find a couple of other educators in your school that can support and encourage each other to just keep going. And for us, we have to keep our town select board updated on, you know, pretty much anything and everything that's going on out there since it is publicly owned. So getting into some pictures, finally. <laughs> um, so along the trails, we have these, uh, oh, Oops, oh gosh, how do I get back? There we go. Um, so we do have some interpretive signs that have been created along the way to, to talk about the different outdoor classroom spaces. As far as the signs go, um, they are actually the same kind of process that um, the state uh, DOT uses to create their signs. And I can certainly you know, give more information about that. But um, I ended up doing the Maine Master Naturalist program back in 2014. And part of my capstone project was to create these signs. So they're out there, not only for the kids to read as they're going around, but also for the general public. So here we have the sign for our tree stump station and for our shelter wood station. Any questions so far? All right, we'll keep moving then. Um, <clears throat> making sure I'm covering everything. So as far as different um, activities go for PLT, there are lots and lots of ways to use Project Learning Tree out into the forest. Some of the things that we have done at our forest, we've done some staff wide project learning tree workshops, which has been really great. That way, everybody has been been trained. Um, and I do recognize that nowadays our, you know, the staff days are uh, pretty much spoken for, for a lot of, you know, learning standards types of things or, or, or uh, reading or the math. But if at all possible, it's great if you can get a, a group of people um, trained for with the project learning tree materials, because then you can work together and bounce ideas off of each other. Um, I shared that we created a learning guide for staff and our learning guide basically has a, a description of each of the outdoor classroom spaces, kind of what the objectives are for that space. Um, or just kind of a little summary of what it is. We also tied it in with specific activities from the project learning tree guide um, that teachers could use. So they didn't have to go out there and say, what do I do with this space? Um, there's information already there to help them. Um, just that some background information and, and uh, links to the project learning tree activities. Another thing that we have done to use a lot of project learning tree activities is we've created, we created forest days. And um, during our forest days, what we did, we took every student outside into the forest for the entire day. And a, a committee of, of people got together and we recruited volunteers to do um, little lessons, half hour lessons, and they would teach them, you know, four, now usually three or four times in the, in the morning. And then we take a lunch break and then three or four times in the afternoon and they would share their activities and the kids would rotate through them. So we had a pretty elaborate um, schedule with about 
30 different classrooms of students wandering through and we would often have 50 or 60 different volunteers um, doing the presenting. So I, you know, if somebody has more questions about those, I can, can share. But it was just a great opportunity um, for students to really see a lot of careers dealing with the forest or with, with the main environment. Um, another way that we've used PLT is guest programs, uh, guest speakers, school programs. I've also, like I said, done a lot with homeschool group uh, in the area with different co-ops and um, different homeschool programs. So it's been a lot of fun. So now I'll get into some of the specific project learning tree um, activities that I've done with kids. And I'm not sure how many of you have copies of, of the project learning tree book. Ah, there it is, it flashes once in a while. <laughs> um, but a couple of the favorite activities that we've done is adopt a tree. Um, it's a great way for kids, as Nicole mentioned earlier, to, to get people to just observe what is already there and to really kind of start forming connections with, with the forest in, in itself. Um, this little, this boy over here is actually trying to figure out how old this tree is. And there's a way you can count the, what's called the whorls on the, the white pine. And uh, he was pretty excited to be able to find a tree that was his age. Um, and then the picture on the right is showing some kids they were looking and doing um, an activity called Trees in Trouble. And in that case, they were kind of peeling back the bark to see what kind of insects they could find and to make some, some observations about what might have you know, caused trouble with that tree, what, you know, if it was insects. Or, you know, in, in this case, it was a tree that had been basically flooded um, to create a pond area. And it was the tree itself was starting to decay. But Trees in Trouble is a really great activity for kids to go out and start to do some assessing of forest health. Getting up into the older ages, the activity called nature's skyscrapers. Um, in the old book, it used to be how big is your tree um, is another great activity that we have done with students where we get them to go out and actually learn using um, just some of the basic forestry tools that foresters would use. So we've got a couple of um, different foresters. One is showing that young man how to use a Biltmore stick. And um, those are, it's just, it's a neat tool for, for students to be able to use to measure heights of trees, diameters of trees, to try to figure out what types, um, how much of a product you can actually get out of the tree. And the one with the, the protractor and the straw is trying to figure out tree heights using some simple math. Um, one of the forest measurement stations in that we have there, um, it shows a cord of wood. And in the front, uh, we had a really creative forester, his name was Paul Memmer, and he created th that log that's in the center of the picture. And he cut dimensional lumber and kind of stacked it together so that students and, and adults can see how dimensional lumber can be cut from logs that it's not necessarily the same size boards, but to really maximize um, the, the, um, the product from that particular tree. Uh, one of the other things that we love about, that I love about Project Learning Tree is that it really can tie into the next generation science standards. Um, and in this case, the kids on the left are looking at uh, microorganisms, microinvertebrates from a pond area that we have. And the, the girls on the other side are, it looks like they're doing another habitat study. And the, the activity is called Field, Forest, and Stream. And it's a, another great activity for um, 
middle school kids, six through eight, to look at you know the different biotic and abiotic components of forests, fields, streams, and start doing some comparisons. Um, so that's another activity for Project Learning Tree that we have used that has been really successful with our students. Questions from what we've done, what I've covered so far. All right, so we'll keep going. Um, as I mentioned, we hadn't done any harvesting of the forest area from 1998 up until 2020. And so right at the start of, of the pandemic, we started doing a harvest. We have um, one area in our forest, which was a very small plantation. We have a bunch of red pines and those pines were actually planted by students back in 1998. And, um, you know, so you can kind of see it's it's got all the little rows. It's one particular species of tree. They're all the same age. But when we were talking with the forester that was helping us with the management plan, he said, you know, these trees are really close together. There's, um, you know, the canopy is really tight. You know, there's not a lot of sunlight getting down into into the the bottom and the trees we could start to see that some of the the growth was slowing down and so we ended up doing a, a pre-thinning of um, we had a you know there's a picture showing the pre-thinning of what the forest looked like before the thinning and then after so we really opened up that canopy area oops sorry um, really opened up the canopy area and the kids can will be able to kind of track um, the the growth on those trees going into the future. And one of the you know favorite activities that teachers really enjoy from Project Learning Tree is a lesson called Every Tree for Itself. And in that particular activity, you use um, chips, whether it's uh, some people use poker chips or pieces of paper or whatever. And you sprinkle down these different colored chips. You have you know, yellow ones for sunlight, blue ones for water, green ones for, for the nutrients and the carbon dioxide. And so you sprinkle those on the ground. Kids pretend that they're the trees and they have to collect those chips. And then they can look and hold them out and compare with each other, you know, who got more sunlight, who got more water, you know, did everybody get the those three components that they need in order to continue to grow? And uh, you can also go in and pretend that you're harvesting some of the trees. Um, so that there's more resources available for the one. And um, I'd really recommend it. It's one of my favorites. So a little bit of information about the forest management harvest that we did. Um, one of the things that we did before this harvesting, as I said, we hadn't done any for a long time. And so we wanted to prepare the students. So when they started to see trucks rolling past their classroom windows full of logs, that they wouldn't freak out that we were cutting the whole forest. Um, so I ended up as a volunteer, I went into all of the, most of the classrooms from pre-K up to sixth grade and did some visits to prepare the students for what was going on out in the forest. We wanted to assure them that we weren't cutting every tree out there. We wanted to show them that um, harvesting can be a good thing or, you know, again, that it, it, we weren't destroying the forest, but we were actually doing things to try to take care of the forest as part of our management plan. Um, and one of the things that we did while we were there, I read a book out loud called Why Would Anyone Cut Down a Tree? See if I can get it to show up. Uh, 
Ah, anyway, I have it on the list of resources at the end. Um, so why would anyone cut down a tree? It's a really great simple picture book, but again, I used it from pre-K up to sixth grade and it was really effective with the kids to kind of explain why we are doing some harvesting out there. I also used an awesome activity called Renewable or Not, and it's actually in the old guide and the new one. And um, in that particular one, it's a simulation. There's a couple of different versions of, of the activity. And I did one where the kids actually become forest managers. And in the activity, it says to use popcorn, but I always use pretzel sticks um, to represent tree trunks. And it shows how kids can manage the forest and still continue to have trees growing in, in, their, in their forest. So it's again, a great, great activity. In addition to doing those things in the classroom, we took the kids out to the, the harvest site to talk to the logger, to see the equipment. Um, we were really lucky they were able to stand far enough back so they could actually see some of the processing um, that was going on out there. So it was really cool for them to see that the logger wasn't just out there cutting every tree, that there were objectives, that there was a reason why he was picking and choosing certain trees. They got to see the equipment, which is, you know, a big hit for, for all of the students. Um, and that was actually on the Friday before the world shut down. So we were really glad that we could squeeze in that visit before things went crazy. And then after the whole harvest was done, we created more of the interpretive signs to put out into the forest at each of the different areas that showed a before and an after photo and explained the harvesting goals and why um, that particular area was harvested the way that it was. And that you know has really good information both for adults and for kids um, because even the adults were um, not really sure Before we do our school-wide forest days, they are interdisciplinary. We try to pull in all the reading, the writing, the math, the history, arts, music, um, and get as many of those integrated um, topics as possible. We really try to keep it very hands-on. We want the kids to to get a little dirty at forest days and to um, to get their hands wet and to really explore the forest more than just going from lecturer to lecturer to lecturer. Um, so it really helps the kids, you know, they get connected to a lot of different careers, whether it's, you know, we have foresters come in, we have the loggers come in, we've had wildlife biologists, we have somebody who comes in um, and does geology lessons and talks about groundwater and, and the importance of that. We've had people come in to talk about entomology, um, you know, whether it, conservation, hydrology, lake ecology, if it has to do with, with the, the natural world, um, we try to find different volunteers who are willing to come in and share their passion with the students and, you know, not every activity has a direct project learning tree link, but many of them do. So those forest days, we've done them. We did them every other year because I said it took about 40 to 50 volunteers to pull off the activities. And it was it was very crazy trying to schedule 30 two to 36 classrooms of <laughs> students and teachers um, to, to go. And each grade level would see probably six or seven activities during the day. So they wouldn't see everybody, but um, we did them every other year since 2000. So over the years, kids really got a great exposure to um, those careers and different aspects of the main environment. All right, so I'm covering things. 
Um, in addition to things that we did with just um, kids during the school day, um, we would also, we've done uh, summer nature programs, day camp kind of situations. These kids made leaf print t-shirts and had a lot of fun with that. We've had uh, scouts in to do different programs out there. We've also done different homeschool groups. We've had college groups come out and do different studies. Um, you know, we've had some community, uh, we've had adults go out to do different community walks. So, you know, hopefully um, people are gaining an understanding of the forest and how it grows and changes and um, what, what good forestry or sustainable forestry looks like. So again, some of the project learning tree, the really great activities that I have found that a lot of teachers have used in K-2, um, in the new guide, they use uh, We All Need Trees is really popular with our staff for grades three to five. Every tree for itself and my green future are, again, perfect for doing forest management activities. Grades six to eight, field, forest, and stream, renewable or not. So it should be or not. Um, and if you are boss, were boss, are great, great activities. And for those of you that are educators, in the back, um, in appendix two, there are units of instruction. So if you're looking for a way to connect activities, you know, one activity to another activity to another activity under a certain topic, um, if you're having to do a lot with standards, those units of instruction is a great resource for you to be able to tap into so you don't have to create it all by yourself. So um, any questions before I go on? I've just got a few more slides left. All right, so some of the challenges that we have faced, and we all know that you know, there are challenges when you're dealing with getting kids out into the forest. Um, one of the things as our advisory committee has, has recognized that we really need to be transparent with the mission of the China School Forest, or actually we call it the community forest at China Schools now because it's owned by the town and not the school. Um, but to be transparent with our mission, with our management, you know, it it is public land and we've realized, you know, we've got to be transparent. We can't give too much information um, because it's it's funny. We've had this forest going since the mid nineties and I still meet community uh, people in our community that say, I never knew that those trails were back there. It just, <laughs> it amazes me. Um, we have a lot of community volunteers that are needed to maintain the trails and the outdoor classroom spaces. It is um, taking care of the forest is not a staff position for the school or for the town. It's all volunteer work. So it's a lot of work and that, you know, it can be a challenge, but um, it's doable. Another challenge is that not all teachers are comfortable with taking kids outside. And there are things, you know, whether they're People are worried about, you know, ticks or being too cold or being too wet or, you know, whatever. Um, just kind of take people for where they are and build on it. And, um, you know, one step at a time. So some students might not be ready to be outside in a free space. I've had kids when I've taken them out, they just kind of take off. Um, so I've done, you know, I've done pre-teaching outside but you often see a side of kids outside that you never see inside the classroom so it's definitely worth it to to take those steps um another challenge is you know as you have staff turnover you've got to introduce them to the trails and to materials that they can use out there uh being creative with the new teaching standards you know it's crazy. Teachers used to be able to just kind of choose what they wanted to study. And now it's, it's a little more, more tricky. Um, 
but are there any other challenges that you face you've tried to be able to get students outside? I'd love to hear your ideas. I was talking with a few teachers last week um, and one of their biggest challenges they were saying was the aspect of like how Maine is a home, home rule state. Um, so there was a district next to them that um, did a lot of outdoor education, but their admin in their district just wasn't, um, hadn't agreed to it yet. Not that they weren't like for it, they, it just was in a stack on their desk. Um, so I know that can be something that can be particularly challenging. And of course, with a lot of turnover and admin and all of that stuff, it can be hard. Yes, I, I agree. It can be very tricky. It, you know, it it's definitely helpful if the administrator is supportive of it. But um, there are also ways to do it, you know, and they might not necessarily be encouraging outdoor education, but hopefully they're not discouraging it either. Um, you know, but unfortunately, you know, there are definitely challenges. Um, one of the things that we have is, of course, you know, the, the tick, ticks and Lyme disease. And so one of the things that I have often done with students is it's called a giant microbe. I got it on Amazon and it's a, a tick, a stuffed tick that is about this big. <laughs> and, um, and then I use a pair of uh, salad tongs, metal salad tongs. And I just, you know, we I teach the kids about ticks and what, you know, that they're arachnids and, you know, what their habitat is like and, you know, what they do. And then I also show, demonstrate, you know, if the tick does get attached to you, you know, we can use the tweezers or the tongs and, um, and, and just very gently remove it. I always in my backpack have, um, some post-it notes and a roll of scotch tape. So if a tick does get onto a student and it has started to, you know, started to bite them, um, I, you know, just take the tick off, stick it in the, on the tape and onto the sticky. And then if I see the parent, I will give it directly to them, but I can also, you know, in other times I've slipped it in, in into an envelope, sealed it up and sent it home with the student. Um, and often I'll follow up with a phone call to the parents just to let them know, hey, you know, it was a tick on them. It was on for a very short time. This is, you know, this is where it is. And um, so, you know, it's definitely a challenge, but it's not insurmountable. Anything else? All right, so a couple of takeaways, um, hopefully. The the project that I've worked on at the China School Forest, um, you know, again, it's been over 25 years to develop all of these trails and outdoor classrooms and all of that. But really, just take it one step at a, at a time. You don't have to um, have all kinds of trails and all kinds of outdoor spaces. You know, even just getting your kids out to a corner of the playground free on your property. It's, it's okay. Just start small and, um, and get them outside doing, doing different things. Um, it always helps to work with a team or at least another coworker for support. It, it's just, it's just nice to have another shoulder, another person to, to uh, experiment with and to do activities with. Um, find your champions who will work with you. You might have some local volunteers who are willing to come in. I know that Project Learning Tree, um, Lena has connections with foresters and natural resource people and um, you know, to be able to help support you in the classroom. You don't have to know it all. It's okay to, um, to say, I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but we can find the answer out together. So don't be afraid to, to say that to kids. And again, using Main Tree and PLT as a resource and to help you make connections um, is definitely, definitely a, 
a big help for educators who want to get kids outside. So uh, let's see, stop sharing. So anyways, like I said, um, I know this was kind of fast and furious, had a lot of information to share, but there are great ways to get outside and to just, just you know, start small if you have to. That's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Pick an activity, try it in the classroom, try it outside. That's that, even on the corner of a playground, getting kids outside and just starting to make those connections are so important. And you can, you know, in our case, we've done a lot of forest management and some education about that, but so much of it starts, as Nicole said, with just observing what's here. What do we have now? What, what might we want to do in the future? Um, those are good places to start. So thank you. Thank you for your time on a, on a busy, busy day. I'm sure many of you are <laughs> ready to, to pack up and head home, but I uh, appreciate spending some time with you today. And I'll turn it back to Lena. Awesome. Um, so I have a few more slides to share just to make sure that you all know the resources that are in the Project Learning Tree Guide, which if you haven't gotten it already, um, I'll be following up with you. Um, just a second here. Um, this week to get that for you. Um, so a couple other activities and some more details on the ones that um, Anita shared. Um, Trees as Habitat is a really good um, opportunity to look at the relationships that might be out. And I mean, it doesn't have to be a forest. It can be like a schoolyard um, field type situation too. Um, <clears throat> but really great way to integrate um, different aspects of um, like living and non-living and different um, groups of organisms and such in um, with the younger grades, kindergarten through age two or, or grade two or three. Um, and then Anita mentioned trees in trouble, which is always a great one, especially um, if your students have heard about things like um, brown-tailed moths and spongy moths or um, emerald ash borer, all of those things. If you um, are in an area that might have them. It's a great opportunity to talk to students about those different issues. And we have um, district foresters in Maine here that can come out and, and bring examples of what a um, emerald ash borer might look like and what they do to a tree and kind of make that a little bit more tangible for students. Um, but another activity that I love is the Discover Diversity, um, which really looks at the um, the data behind the diversity of a space and taking a really small bite of an outdoor area and really diving into the different um, species that are there. Um, but especially with forest management, I think that the fun stuff um, can come at a little bit of the older ages, so six to eight, but also in high school. Um, there's some really awesome opportunities to get students involved in forest management and the decision-making process. Um, this can certainly happen at younger ages too. Um, but if you were the boss, has a bunch of different student pages in the back of that activity that essentially like walks you through the decision-making process of laying out goals that might be there, um, different community partners who might be involved in the decision-making process and all of their goals that they might have to really put that all on paper and make it a little bit more um, dynamic as to how that process happens and make it more realistic. Um, and there could always be some really cool opportunities to get students involved in the actual process if, you have um, a forest or a piece of land uh, a butcher school or something like that. There can be some really great ways to get them involved with a land trust that might own the property or the town. Um, and Improve Your Place is also a really great one because if they have that um, space that abuts school or is close to a school or what have you, um, it essentially walks you through how you might make a change 
change to the space that you have um, or the piece of land that you have and what those different changes might be, how that might affect the land, all of those different types of decisions would be involved there. Um, but just so that you are aware of the different resources that are available, um, there's a document that accompanies the guide that goes through all of the different, um, breaks down each activity and all the different um, standards that it teaches to. Um, and then one of the indices in the back of the guide goes through all the different skills that are taught in each activity. Um, so you can filter out activities by um, that indice, but also um, like Anita was saying, there are some indices that talk about um, subjects or um, different topics that are talked about and such, um, but that can be helpful if you have a gap that you need to fill or something like that, or looking for a specific activity to do to meet a certain need. Um, and then more PD. Um, so we have our Forest of Maine Teachers Tours, which I mentioned in the beginning here, um, but I also work with districts to get professional development like Anita mentioned. Um, so if you have a couple of your colleagues that are looking for options, feel free to let me know. I'd love to get you guys connected. Um, but we have a lot of opportunities for working with different community partners in Maine because we have such a well-established natural resources sector and there are a ton of different um, people that work for land trusts and nonprofits and um, IFNW or the district foresters. All those folks are really excited to get kids involved with what they do and also to just come to a classroom and show what they do. Um, so show you how a forester could come and show you how they look at a forest and the different things that jump out to them and how that might be entirely different than what you see. Um, just to get some exposure and maybe take a day of um, class off of your hands so that there's another voice there too. Um, but if you all have any questions, we're here to answer them now. Um, but our contact information is here. Um, and I'll make sure you have Anita and Nicole's contact info as well. Um, if you come across anything in the meantime. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention, even though I'm not in Maine right at the moment, there are some other educators at the community forest at China School. And so if I'm not sure where people are from, but if you are ever interested in doing a walk around the forest and would like to see a little bit more about it, um, I'm sure I can arrange for somebody to take you out and to, to get a peek at it. Um, and on the Facebook page, it's just the uh, community forest at China School. Somebody, and I'm not even sure who it is, um, recently did like a nine minute video of out in the forest and walking around and showing some of the different outdoor classroom spaces with their children. Um, and that link is on the Facebook page. So it's really kind of a fun little short video if you wanted to get a little better picture and idea of what's out there. Awesome. Well, I'll hang out here if anybody has any questions that um, they want to get answered. Um, and then feel free to let us know if you have questions or ideas that you want to um, brainstorm about or any barriers you come across. Um, I'd be happy to help with those types of things as well along the way. Jennifer, where are you located? I'm in Madison. Um, okay, so... Not that far from China. And this is right. my first time hearing about what's been going on in China. It's like the dream um, <laughs> that I've had for many years. So to hear that other people are doing this successfully is wonderful. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, I don't think I even showed a picture um, on my slides, but we have a basically a tree house um, that's like four feet up off the ground. And when we designed it, we put a, a ramp so that students in wheelchairs could get up into the, the treehouse. It's pretty cool. I drew a diagram um, <laughs> on my notebook because that is, that's part of my vision. Um, we have a big tree that we call Steve. That my uh -huh. kindergartners have Aww. adopted. Um, and so that's, that's part of our plan is to find some, it's not in this grant, um, but to find some funding to get that treehouse built. We have four students in my school right now who are non-ambulatory in wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a high, high population of students with needs in our little school. And so that's been kind of a passion to get them the opportunity to get out into the woods. So we're, we're finally seeing some progress, which is good, um, mm -hmm. but there's still a long ways we could go developing the wonderful resource that we have here that's never been never been tapped 